Um, he runs one of uh, India's uh, best Gen.I. community, uh, and he has collaborated with a bunch of folks already to, uh, you know, get to one of play. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, Nilan, I think it would be great if you can maybe this short intro about yourself and then we can get started. Cool. Uh, is that is that a mic for the folks on Zoom? Yeah. Cool. I'll this. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been doing mostly natural language processing since 2018-19. I've built, I built the first Hindi language model, built one of, I uh, did a lot of work in English code switching, things like that. I uh, have an ACL paper around that, so mix of startup and industry in that sense. Uh, so if you have used something like Mega, and if you've been if you have entered the support board, that's because of the bad tech which I have built. Uh, but it's also very affordable for Nega. So that's the trade-off. Uh, as is most things in tech. Uh, so that's that's some of the things I've done. Uh, more recently, I've worked with a bunch of YC companies who have worked on problems like text to SQL, some image generation projects, uh, some mix of these, and a lot of uh, good old enterprise workflow automation problems, which are as unsexy as they sound and are as rewarding in money as they sound. So, uh, so have had some fun mix of startup and enterprise exposure over the last few years. Uh, in terms of infra, I have done a lot of on premise work, doing a lot of OCR search. And because of the work which I did for Nika during my Sunday World Tour, I am also familiar with all the cloud uh, standard Kubernetes, horizontal scaling challenges that's that's the sense of my background so yeah is that I, I i'll open to the floor before I start. <laughs> yeah no most of us are already here because we've already heard of you because uh, already a lot of people i think a lot of us are already in the jni group as well um so who did so i think i've already given you the context the audience is all dc folks uh analysts and associates mm. of course uh, the partners are iq uh so you know we're all just trying to you know make sense of what's happening around us right now yeah. Uh, so this is the first of a series of lectures uh, where we're going to deep dive into uh, uh, the disruptions across B2B applications, b c applications, and a little bit of uh, uh, infra and tooling. But you know, we really want to start off with a deep dive, um, at least a one-on-one on the tech itself, right? And, you know, we thought who is better to sort of take us through this hmm. than you. Um, so yeah, over to you. Okay, I'll I'll open with a question so that I know who am I speaking to because I want to transfer into myself, but I did not. Share the embarrassment with you. So uh, I'm, I'm just just a fast fast show of hands. How many of you have played with ChatGPT for more than ten conversations? Awesome. How many of you have, are paying for the GPT for the twenty dollar per month thing? One. Okay. Uh, moving on Zoom. Cool. Uh, how many of you use any plugins from the GPT four? Okay. Same person. You have a favorite person. What's your name? Urja. Good. Uh, I don't know your name. Uh, okay. How many of you have used stable diffusion in any way? Okay. How many of you have heard what is stable diffusion? So this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I still need the like, show hands. Um, how many of you use at least use the Discord bot for mid journey? See, no, first guy. Discord bot ke upar hi jaake apne. Aage try karna. Sir, but the phone bhi nahi hai show hands pe. Nahi hai. Dekho, sir, ek do jo. <laughs> that is why I'm asking. Okay, so uh, I think I should open with the idea that for a lot of this uh, sort of the emerging tech, a lot of it is like learning how to ride a bicycle. I will give you through a uh, theory of riding a bicycle and it's going to be as useful as theory of riding a bicycle can be, which is I will tell you there's going to be a chain, there's going to be a handle, but it's not going to help you learn anything about balance. The only way to do that is to do it yourself. So uh, that is the caveat, which I think I should open this. And I think you should keep this in context with every uh, internal project you look at, every dev tooling project you look at, that these are all about theory of riding a bicycle and absolutely nothing is going to come as close as to actually try to ride a bicycle. And a lot of these things, because they are either built for B2B or B2C use cases, you are the end users. So if you're thinking, I am not an engineer, but I don't know this, that's fine. Probably no one engineer who knows how to make an API call. That's literally all the friction. And uh, now, uh, and if there's like less than 50% people who have not read a Discord bot, that's a low benchmark. So, uh, stable diffusion, I understand, it's slightly expensive to run, slightly tricky to run. You have to post your own GPU and things like that, or, you, or at least uh, set up automatic 11, 11, or something like that. I get that there's a lot of friction around stable diffusion. Uh, but mid-journey Discord bot is like, this, like no friction. You have to install an app and set it up. It's less friction than Instagram, to be honest. So if you have set up Instagram five years ago, you should be able to set up this part today. Uh, with that, uh, can I request this Zoom link so that I can set yes. up sites?
approach. How many of you have heard of open AI functions? Heard of? Yeah. Heard of. What do you do for the living? Recording and that explains it. Right. Why don't you mute it on there so that we use that? Term. Well, yeah. I'll mute it myself. I still need to share. What is by the way open AI function? I'll get to that. Uh, how many of you have seen one of those auto GPT BB88 demos which have been doing the rounds on Twitter? Yeah, quite popular. <laughs> Here, I see some nods. Uh, show of hands. Okay, half the room. Uh, at its crux, what is agenting behavior? If it's, if it's, uh, and I'm going to go all over the place. So if I, if I speak too fast, interrupt me. Don't keep your questions for the last. Ask them when they come to you because the odds are if it has come to you, it has also come to somebody else in the room. Uh, if you ask it, you'll sound smart. Uh, these are all boilerplate slides because I prepared these slides for talking to CXOs uh, and I'm trying to explain what is different this time. Uh, and the basic thesis is that every new unlock in hardware and software combination uh, gives you a new first, uh, first set of companies. For instance, a lot of the mobile first is what you think of today is Uber, Ola, and TikTok. And to some extent, let's say even Instagram, they're all mobile first. Without a cheap camera, cheap GPS, uh, very affordable Google Maps, these companies would have not existed. Okay. So I'm going to compete with HDMI make a timeout. Fun. Uh, he's very familiar. Uh, how many of us know Archive except Roger? Okay, cool. Uh, fun. So Archive is a very good proxy for figuring out if there's a new emerging field in tech because almost all tech phenomena, at least in machine learning and allied fields, uh, with the notable exception of front-end engineering, typically publish their work as academic output in the first few quarters of the hype cycle. So all through 2020 and 2021, you could see that something is heating up. So you could predict that GV3 is going to happen when text by which zero zero came out in July and August by looking at that trend. And that is why I put my most recent job in October. So, uh, so that's, 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 I have at least made a bit on that. Uh, so I can say that, brag about that. Uh, I want to talk about large language models because that's, that's what most of generative AI today is. I will not talk about the image generation piece uh, in an attempt to uh, not go all over the place. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. At its core crux, we, we think of large language models as a magic prediction black box, and that's probably true. And in all earnest, Sam Altman or Elia, the chief scientist at OpenAI, has no deeper insight than you or me who has used ChatGPT. For sure, they have probably spent 40 times the time which we have spent on using these tools, and they have obviously built it, but they don't have an expert insight on this. They have an expert insight on how to tame this, how to make it work for the things they do. But there is no expert insight on how it functions. It's almost at the same level that I don't have an expert insight on when one of my colleagues goes out and figures out, okay, how do I get this operations thing done? Right? So for instance, a Swiggy Ops person in Bangalore is basically a genius, right? Because that guy orchestrated something like 10,000 deliveries in a peak four hour window in Bangalore, which even by let's say 200 years ago standards is basically genius, right? So that's that's what I'm trying to say. What, what do we mean by being able to take? So I have no visibility on how somebody in ops brains work. Uh, what do these terms stand for? I'm going to skip this very boilerplate. Uh, transformers. Uh, I should ask me something like seven times to explain this word. And that is why this is here. Uh, <laughs> but I'm also curious how many of you have heard of this term earlier? Yes, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about listening to you. I'm talking about listening to you. I'm talking about So, Transformers, at its very, very simple uh, intuition to build around it is, it's two main components. One is it tries to predict something next to it, and it has a memory of retaining what has, has already seen. 
and the memory updates based on what it sees the next time and so on. That's that's the very simple intuition of it. And it does not, what this also means by extension is it always have a position context. So something which it sees immediately or most recently will have more weight than something which it sees in the middle. That is almost all of these models, right? Including GVD uh, 3.5, GVD 4, uh, stable diffusion backbone, which is also transformers with a CNN unit. Uh, so that's the basic condition of transformers. Every yes. when you say attention is all you need, what else don't you need? Oh, that's a very long list. Um, so you 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 think that this is like basically this is becoming a very small piece of code in very like manageable memory size because you are focusing only on attention. It's not just about memory size, more importantly, it's about your engineering effort. Okay. Yeah. So as an example, uh, all the way to, I think about 2017, 18, 19, a lot of these computer vision systems, you could use a lot of deep graphical lens and you would build this, like very, very large graphs over like a 80 GB RAM, it used to be huge in 2018. And uh, you would try to do basic things like recommend what item is the next person going to buy. Right. And this used to be very computationally expensive. You would need like some a seven member engineering team with two of them having a PhD to just build the graph and four engineers to just maintain the graph, right? So for instance, uh, if we were to look at Pinterest, Pinterest has, this, I'm forgetting his name, I think Pedro Numas, that guy spent close 15 years solving this problem of, can I predict what will this user buy next or click next? Because they're the same action by and click it in proxy for the other. And uh, eventually, that has now become something like one takes the value which it was 10 years. That's, that's an example of, you know, graphs becoming less relevant or their value being substituted by modern approaches. The other part of it is uh, every domain, so to say, like text, language, uh, music, videos, uh, images, had their own set of approaches. So very famously, uh, if you've heard of transformers, you've also probably heard of convolutional neural networks or CNNs. Uh, they are and were very popular for a lot of computer vision work. So all from the first machine learning hype cycle of my career, the famous article was that uh, Andrew went out on TV and said that uh, AI will replace all radiologists who can predict that whether somebody has cancer or not. Uh, clearly it was wrong, uh, but that was based on CNN's as an approach. And it was very well uh, popularized uh, and has been tested to death. One advantage which a lot of those approaches had is they were very really sample efficient, which is very, uh, it's a very fancy way of saying that 10,000 samples uh, with CNNs can sometimes do what for with transformers you might, like three years ago, you might need a million samples. So the ratio were off. Today, obviously, the world looks very really different, especially across multiple domains. But today, with transformer as a backbone, you can do all of these. So you can do images, you can do text, you can do music, you can do video images. Think of something and you can do it. In fact, I know this very fun project where somebody is trying to do this pressure sensor. What that is, means is you can at some level mimic touch. Because what is touch? Touch is ultimately some degree gradient of smoothness of pressure, right? Like it's over time, like you're moving on the surface and the exact that point. So that's that's. So you can compress all of those in these mechanisms. Uh, so in that sense, this has become a general purpose approximation of any data set, any domain, any problem. Acro obviously, the amount of data you need, the amount of engineering effort you need to put varies quite a lot because there are all different maturing levels. Text is cheapest computationally and collecting, and it's easiest to collect thanks to uh, engineering being very good at scraping things. Uh, but that's mainly a function of maturity curves. Uh, the downside is CNNs are very fast, right? In the sense, CNNs by design can run a lot of operations in parallel, which transformers can't. So for a lot of computer vision applications, even today, a CNN based setup could cost one fifth to one tenth of a transformers based setup. And that is who start with. If you optimize those things, you could get to something like one fifteenth of something like that. And that's like 150 optimization is not like you don't need like a team of 10 PhDs to get started. You can probably get started with one slightly smart engineer spending a year at it. 
and that's very valuable for a lot of industries that cost as a center. Uh, famously, Snap has a team which does basically CNN optimizations even today. So, you know, one more question a lot of folks had is uh, this transformers as an architecture has been like around like six years, I think, right? What happened over the last, let's say, 18 months, 12 to 18 months that suddenly uh, you've seen so much innovation across so many different applications? You know, what's that revolution sort of built? So, one is I wouldn't say it's very sudden. Uh, that is what I was trying to point out earlier that this has been somewhat visible, right? So, when GPT uh, two came out. Uh, that was a meaningful step up from whatever uh, else earlier was there. And if any of you have a M1 or a M2 machine, you can train your own GPT-2 model. So, for instance, one of the fun things which I have done is I have downloaded all my WhatsApp chats with my father. So now I don't have to get yelled at by him. <laughs> I can just talk to that bot. So, but that's a GPT-2 bot, and you can do it on your own. Uh, so, so and it's very good, surprisingly good, even today. It's very outdated. What has changed over the last 24 months uh, is one is people have realized that you can throw really, really large data centers, not just GPUs in isolation or uh, modern compute at it. And you can the existence of large data sets. And that is why a lot of this has started from text and image because those were the data sets which were cheaply available. So for everything up to 2018, 19, right? Every time somebody would ask me a question like, why what has changed? I would say compute became cheaper. But the compute price, if you were to look at an NVIDIA, uh, if you were to do something like, I don't know, operations per dollar ratio, which is equivalent of uh, kilometers per rupee, if you were looking at a car mileage, uh, that has roughly remained same since 2020. Uh, partly because of crypto, and then partly because Azure just outbidding everybody else so that they can run open AI workloads. It has remained roughly the same, including modern. I think the P, sorry, not P, the 4090 Ti series is 2% faster than the previous edition and costs about, I think, $1,200 more. Uh, so NVIDIA has really learned from their inspiration, which is Apple, that you can sell same hardware for more, just rebranded for the next year. And everybody who runs a data center or pays for it knows this, uh, but I am always glad to run into founders who don't know this. Uh, so, and so because Ultimately, it's a mileage question. So that's that's the huge stick there. The other part, what has happened is large GPUs, which have large RAMs, became uh, uh, more easily available. Is probably a good way to put it. So while the operations have been available for a long time, because you cannot split a model uh, very easily, you need large RAMs. You will hear everybody uh, in SF crying about we don't have enough A hundreds. Mm -hmm. uh, why is 800, uh, 40G, 80G, any of these, or even let's like say 320G uh, more so valuable? Is because well, you can take a multiple copies of the same model uh, and run it on a very large GPU. You cannot split a model. So it violates your traditional horizontal uh, scaling way of thinking that I can virtualize every CPU, virtualize every bit of my uh, CPU RAM. You, you just can't do that with GPU yet. And that is also that is also what shows up in Nvidia the stock price in many ways. So uh, because base the one of the advantages which you get with this like 4090 or 800s over the previous iteration is that these RAMs are much larger. So, like you start at 40 GB instead of 18 or 20 GB or plus that. So something like that. This has changed over these iterations. Uh, after these GPUs came out, you need something like six to nine months to actually train them. And that is why most of these have come out in late 2022 because a lot of these GPUs came out in late 2021. So about four or five months for people to realize, oh, now I can do this. And another four to six months for them to actually do this. So that's that's the rough trend. But if you were, uh, let's say if you had tried TextDaVinci 002 or TextDaVinci 003, which is where uh, I finally bought onto the hype, uh, you could see that this is actually a very, Predictable, uh, like you can extrapolate from that point on. Uh, uh, so this is at least in some ways an uh, extension to your uh, the answer I was giving to you. Uh, one thing which I forgot to mention already is the zero shot behavior, which CNNs were not good at. Uh, what does zero shot mean? Uh, sir, what's your good name? Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to prompt him for his name. He already knew his name. That's a zero shot behavior. 
it's it's always there you always already know it even though your name is something which everybody else uses you rarely use it right you only use it when you introduce yourself or when somebody asks you explicitly that's a very characteristic behavior of a zero shot behavior that, that you don't have to give any examples that is what we call a zero shot behavior that is most commonly seen in transformers cn sometimes have that uh but you have to put in a lot of design data set uh edge cases around that uh we know in context learning is everybody uh, has used it for 10 times so i assume you have also used it to edit emails things like that everything which you put in that body is what we call context uh that's that basically what it is so when you say please don't this give me an email that's in context learning this nothing fancy word it's just academy slang um uh, tool use that's that's my uh favorite thing to look out for from this point on uh it's basically some version of reasoning or uh best guess behavior which is if i were to ask somebody in this room to pass me a water bottle they are not going to think about my hand is a tool or and my fingers can grip it it's almost a muscle memory the equivalent in software is if you go to swiggy app and you place click a button which has a restaurant menu menu uh all of these apis are orchestrated by uh swiggy for you on your behalf so now think of an equivalent software which is more general than swiggy and can say hey i'm going to go so and so place and i'm going to reach and by the time make sure that by the time i reach there make sure there is a dunder order place for i don't know a cake from magnolia and a flower cake from so and so place so that by the time i reach there i have it ready to give it to my girlfriend so uh, all of this instruction which is natural language converted into apis and then deciding which apis to call because obviously that software needs to have access all of the apis including all of my calendar real time apis everything is what we call to use so the most interesting way to keep it in your head is a, a virtual assistant or a secretary uh, but with all the uh, expertise of an api so it can do things which a secretary can't because a secretary might not have access to your bank account uh, but these apis do or will do sorry uh chain of thought instruction following instruction following is also i believe very familiar because everybody said that they have read chat gpt i'm going to skip that chain of thought okay let's also skip that in the interest of time hmm which of these names are most familiar the say which of do you see first they doubt loud notion notion cool okay neva neva okay Coda, Mid Journey. Cool. Uh, very very familiar names. See, so what that means is by extension, a lot of the character AI Harvey is not familiar. Is that correct? I need some cues. Yeah, no, I think Harvey. Uh, so Harvey. So you will get that. Cool. So very. It is familiar. Uh, the only reason the slide even exists. is what i want to point out is the slide is incomplete all of these players are trying to latch and add ai to an existing stack which will work against them and the incumbent will always have an advantage if you're adding ai instead of taking an ai first experience so in the universe of mobile waze lost to uber not because waze was terrible at routing or optimization algorithms but because waze did not factor in the gps on phone was cheaper uh which uber could factor in by sheer intuition but that's a technological way to look at it so all of the right stack which is consumer vertical productivity native they are all trying to add it in some ways for instance notion and coda are built on the anthropic and cloud stack how are you trying to do the open ai way mid journey has their own models but because uh they are trying to build their own models they're going to burn a lot of their gpu money uh, very quickly or they can just make money and get out of the business which is equally fair because they're making 200 mil or something like that in a year so a uh, great deal uh neva glee moveworks are all peers in the sense that they are all search enterprise search companies do you know which is today's largest enterprise search company google no not say just microsoft the microsoft teams search which is arguably the world's worst search experience possible uh handles more local searches than most other enterprises put together 
that's just because of it's locally running on your teams and teams is basically a chrome extension which is worse than a chrome extension uh, <laughs> so uh, so all in all of these behaviors an enterprise player who already has existing sales distribution all of those has an head start so does uh, that mean that in all these salesforce plugins and you know things like for salesforce or you know employing microsoft teams for example all that will be distributed first those incumbent platforms start with the ai they will come together yeah unless i think 91 was that company funded in last five years hmm. where has been that I'm so sorry for your pollution. Yes, sorry, just to explain this out, right? So I, I understand you have these four tabs on, on the right hand side. Uh, that's not vertical, right? Harvey and Red Journey, for example. Why are they in the same bucket? Um, They're all uh, applications which you directly interface with. All the other three, which is tools, models, chips, are more dev centric or infrastructure or separate from the. Uh, uh, no, let me uh, change that question a bit. Uh, what I mean is that I understand that AI, you know, a lot of this is extension. For example, we're saying the word is going to do a lot of integrate a bunch of open AI into it, and therefore we get notion or some version of that should not exist. Right? But for guys who are creating something out of nothing, mm -hmm. right? like a hobby or a mid journey, maybe, why do they get bucketed just like everybody else does? Good question. So the world's largest legal library is with LexisNexis, and they have an exclusive partnership with OpenAI. So does Harvey. Uh, but LexisNexis already has legal partnerships with everybody from the Saudi government to the Russian government to the US government. So they get an incumbent advantage there. The mid journey beer case is stable diffusion with control net. The reason mid journey wins right now is Discord and the feedback they get from Discord, which allows them to iterate on user feedback. The downside of that is they're very good at faces, but bad at everything else. And if you were to look at what do humans pay for in terms of images, uh, and you can pull this data from something like Getty Images and all their balance sheets, uh, you will realize that we don't always pay for a nice looking human being. We also pay a lot of premium for just war photos, which have humans and an extension of that. And everything else is templatized humans. That is why you will see every SaaS company over the last five years that's going to get reduced to the standard cartoons, which are flat to the cartoons, right? Uh, because nobody wants to pay for a human photo there. And if you make it cheaper, which is what Mitchell is trying to do, it doesn't solve anything because it's anyway priced to zero or trending to zero. Does that, does that answer your question? Sure. I think the so. I've answered your question specifically for Harvey and Mitchell, but not in general. The in general argument is. We have to differentiate between an incumbent and um, for Harvey that's Lexus Nexus. For Majorney, the incumbent is stable diffusion. And you also have to figure out whether they have enough margins in that. A lot of verticalized plays only makes sense if you can make enough margins on that. If you're running on 15, 20% margins over a 10-year window, you don't have enough margins. You don't have software margins for sure. And how large are the incumbents and etc. Right? Like much pretty much harder to replace Microsoft than. No, I would argue that stable diffusion and Microsoft are roughly equally hard to displace because the adoption for stable diffusion is uh, okay. A better example would be let's say Adobe Firefly versus stable diffusion. For context, Adobe Firefly takes or tries to take the legal risk, which stable diffusion does not because it's the concern. So, a lot of the large enterprises, for instance, if you were to go and talk to Target in India, they will say, okay, I'll give a shot to Adobe Firefly because they will at some point when they're out of video. Be willing to take the legal risk as Adobe has done in the past. Who takes that legal insurance or accountability risk in case of a copyright violation uh, is an open ended question for stable diffusion. And uh, a good precedent to think about is uh, this is Dali lost out to stable diffusion while the net gap between them was roughly three months. Three months. April is when Dali 2 came out, and July or August is when stable diffusion 1 came out. Uh, and open a basically said, so this should, I'm not doing images anymore. Right. And then to make sure that nobody comes out for speech to text, they immediately licensed Whisper and got it out in September or October. They got Whisper out, which is speech to text for English. And I think November or December was it GPT 3 release and 3.5 chart release was December or January, something like that. So this really put them on the spot. The stable diffusion launch really put them on the spot that our entire advantage is talent and compute. And if you don't move fast enough, open a, uh, open source will catch up first. That is the rest of all verticalized place. 
that in the build versus buy behavior, all open source tends to bias you towards build very heavily because it outsources all your resource risk. Have I have I answered your question, No, no, I tried an interesting question. I think I've answered a what in this question. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, this is fun. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I think we've discussed this also because I was making that point. Uh, so we skip this. Uh, this is the point which I was just. Uh, and this is a good segue. Uh, build versus buy. Um, so the other no, other side of the zero shot behavior or not needing too much data for especially for text is uh, exactly what this side of the left said. That a good prompt is worth hundreds of hundreds of data points. So that is why when you say, "Actually, give me this email in the side of some pirates of Caribbean," you can actually get it because it already knows what pirates of Caribbean is. But it also means that you cannot elicit completely new behavior. You can mix, match, combine, reway, but you cannot elicit something which is very far from the norm. So this makes the norms very sticky. If that makes sense. So the further away you go from the norm and whatever is your domain, the harder and more expensive that will be. Uh, so that's that's the idea. The uh, if you're an investor and the company comes to you and says, I can make this a small language model around this, uh, I hope you have my phone number because I'm, I'm very bullish on that thesis. Uh, the basic idea is very straightforward. For everything which large language models do really fast, really well. They're also very expensive. So while they may be good for getting your first I don't know, 100k million dollars in your account, uh, they're really terrible for your margins. Large language models and margins just don't mix well. They're like alcohol and whatever doesn't mix with alcohol. So, uh, so that's another part. Uh, all large language models are terrible at wit and humor because they've been trained to be basic. So uh, small large language models are as we like used to call them in the old world, just language models, which are trained for specific domain, specific task, make sense at a certain scale because building them still requires you have a lot of past data. All your classical level problems still exist. You still need a lot of talent. You still need a lot of compute. Maybe not to the same extent as large language model. You can do a GPT-2 model on this Mac, but I also need a use case for GPT-2 to already exist. So now suddenly you have reframed a tech problem as a GTM problem. You can not worry about a tech, go to market, figure out what sells, get your 100k, half million, whatever is your definition of product market fit, then swap it out. Once you have the money coming in, once you have built user trust, and you can also very cleverly triage, you can say, oh, this is a use case, which I know that my model is doing well. And when you see that request specifically for the user, you use the cheaper model. This is how you build your margins incrementally. This is the equivalent in what you might have seen in hyperlocal. Every company started by giving you everything for basically at eighty percent discounts, and I now the charge you charge for the platform fee on a twenty fifty dollar. So four percent platform fee. Uh, Visa is looking at one and half percent margin and crying that he is telling you four percent. So if you make a hundred percent, hundred fifty dollar. Uh, this is the more generic version of what I've been trying to say between the incumbent and disruptors, uh, like incumbent and startups, which is. Uh, we are all still thinking about the first two, which is adding something to our surface, which is all the email, sending a message, workflow, which we have done, uh, some degree of automation. The most important fun thing is when you replace an existing behavior. So as a extreme example, what I've done is I had a vendor who used to help me manage the WhatsApp community. Uh, and used to write scripts for it so that I could find out people who are not contributing and throw them out. Now I don't do that. The script is written by a code interpreter, which is a GPT-4 plugin. I wet the script, I read it that it's correct, and it just does it. So this is a replacement of a workflow. I've removed my entire hiring, raise a pull request, review that code, all of that workflow to one step, which is give me the code, I review it, execute it, done. So it's a compression of something like 15 step workflow into a three step workflow. Uh, and the last level, which I've not seen any really good examples of, which is doing the work for uh, a customer without them knowing, almost like a agent would, like a, a concierge would. Uh, 
or a manager of manager assigning it to a manager doing it. Uh, I have not really seen good examples of this, but I'm very, very optimistic that they will emerge in the next six to 12 months. Uh, and as, as a uh, note of optimism, because I feel like I've been un, unusually pessimistic, uh, if somebody wants, startups will try. And I really believe that in this scenario, because uh, old school taxis and ways could not adapt to the Uber world, I still believe that there is, in this in particular, uh, the third and fourth series, which is replacing an uh, true blue automation, startups do have an unfair advantage that they don't have any old way of thinking which they've ingrained as an organization. So they're not fighting any mental organizational debt. Uh, I've already spoken about uh, DNA, I've spoken about error handling in parts and pieces, model cost, uh, boring, uh, alignment, is anyone interested in hearing about alignment? No. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to double down on that thesis of agents. Um, because now I'm basically, so everything which I've spoken so far is 2020 to 2023 of July. Now I'm going to say 2023 July, something like summer of 24 or spring of 24. Uh, I want to focus on three main ways of thinking. Uh, the first is generate the code, which is what code interpreter does. Generate the code for your input set. That's about it. And I'm done. There is no tool usage happening there unless you count the tool execution, the code language execution environment itself as a tool. But that's not tool in the truest sense, right? I mean, we have been using CPU and memory for a while. That is what code interpreter extends by making a sandbox. Uh, that is really powerful because it basically makes all SD ones unemployed. Uh, but that's, that's the extent of it. The next level is something like uh, Gorilla LLM. Uh, it's a UC Berkeley project, still slightly researchy, uh, but stable enough for me to say that this is a direct, the, the directional trend. What it does is it has a built-in environment in which you can just call APIs, similar to code interpreter. And then it looks at the end output and says whether it is correct or not, and then you iterate. That's what. What happens at the end is you can just give all of those as natural language instructions. So you can give one uh, API, something like seven commands. Let's say, uh, can you do an OCR of this? Can you tell me the sentiment of this? Can you tell me of all my Play Store reviews who were the ten unhappiest customers and what did they complain about? Uh, all of those the same one function, same endpoint, it will figure out what is the best way to do it across all its tool set, do it on your behalf and give you the answer and tell you how you did it, how it did it. So that in case you disagree with it, you can inspect it and ask it to change it. Uh, the ask it to change it piece is unstable and that is why I'm calling it research. But selecting and doing it is very stable. And I say this by trying it myself. Uh, and then obviously there are other people. Uh, Agent A is basically a library which I wrote, uh, but it's, it's built on a more general idea. I've taken out a slice of it, which is any language. We always had trouble taking any language instruction and converting it into some sort of API, which has been a resistance in some way for software abundance. Uh, you always needed this. Like the way I joke about this. Uh, the reason product managers are valuable is because they are uh, user interview to engineer translators. Uh, and what this library does is it removes the product manager use case. Now you have a translation which is all support. Uh, and it, it has a bunch of fun examples, uh, it's like for instance, medical notes, and you can get a very decently structured Python object out of that instruction, uh, which you decide, every user can decide. You give a natural language and it will convert it into a Python object. It's not you can use whatever whatever the hell you want to do with it. Uh, with a very, very high degree of confidence. In my error benchmark, which I ran, so take it with something like 10 kgs of salt, uh, I got an error rate of something like 7 and something, uh, which is pretty impressive. I was expecting closer to something like 2000 uh, from 10,000, but when I got something like 7 and 1000, I was like, there's no point running this move. Uh, so, yeah. That's that's the uh, on the e-learning side. Other part of this is open source. Yes, there are, there are other there, there are open source alternatives of this going to come out in the next three weeks. I'm willing to take a wager on that. Uh, they will come out because 
it's too powerful an idea and too easy to implement for somebody to not do it. If nobody does it in three weeks, I'll make it. So, and, and I can probably do it in like 10 days, so then you get like five, six weeks. So, uh, and then there are precedent. It's just, it's very doable. It's just extremely tedious. You have to just sit and slog for tens of hours, but it's very doable. Like, the idea is in general, you do open source, open air, they are all going to be comparable quality, it doesn't matter anymore. You can get the GPT uh, 3.5 version of open air functions uh, very cheaply, like basically very cheaply is on a $3 an hour GPU today. In two months, that will probably look like a dollar an hour GPU. So, the rationality of this is. Uh, this cost is tending to zero. Yeah. Um, wait, what about that? So, this then, there is still a lot of uh, race left in the next six to 18 months, which is incorporated in the existing product behavior, which is what I was trying to point out earlier that the incumbents, existing players, by existing relationships, have an advantage uh, because they can build uh, very fast. And they can use a lot of these things uh, internally very quickly. So, for instance, the only enterprise which has paid me for that like really so far for the open air functions wrapper uh, is a Fortune 500, right? Nobody in India even has thought of open air functions, and there is a Fortune 500 company paying me for this. So, the asymmetry in maturity is something what I am seeing for the first time in my career. Uh, short career, but still uh, interesting novel experience. So, uh, a lot of the user experiences. Uh, as I was saying, we are still trying to automate part of it, replace it thoda baat, uh, but not going far enough. What we can do is throw away large chunks of our stack if we want to. Uh, everything could be, like you don't need a lot of visual interfaces anymore. Like all of those interfaces where you have to go and apply for leads for three days and then somebody goes and approves is all terrible. This should all be, always have been slack bots, uh, but now this just makes it like if the cost of building that UI is 50 cents per interaction and if the cost of this language thing is 10 cents per interaction, independent of whether the language is better experience or not, a 5x price differential run over 10 years will drive it towards that. That's, that's the way I reason about it. That the reason software wins is over a sufficient utilization, it just drives the cost uh, down massively. Uh, yeah. I will, yeah, I will actually wait. I will, uh, let me, I'll stop here for questions and then I'll talk about software specific, uh, <clears throat> which is probably interesting only to Urja, which is fine. Uh, she was in the room. So, yeah. So, there are a few questions that folks are asked on the form, and then maybe you can open it up to the rest of the group as well. Yeah. So, uh, one of the common questions was, you know, how far behind are open source models compared to these proprietary models? Because that decides a lot of. How people also build on top of it. Uh, in my personal use, it and by a lot of benchmarks for a lot of text based things, <laughs> the Lama 213B and the Lama 270B is competitive to GPT 3.5 from January, February. Uh, GPT 3.5, which we use in June, is meaningfully different and better. Uh, but directionally, it seems like open source will catch up before end of this year. And I think there's a team called Recommend AI. New Hermes, that's the brand. Uh, they have a 13B model fine tuned already, which was, I think, done in like I think 96 hours after Lama 2 came out. And they are also competitive to the GPT 3.5 benchmark from April of this year. So that means directionally, it looks like it, it, it will catch up to GPT 3.5 for sure. Uh, whether something will catch up to GPT 4 or code interpreter, uh, I'm, I'm not very optimistic, at least for next six months. Because at this point, it's very clear that the true open AI mode was always talent and RLHF, or basically very, very large, high quality data annotators. Uh, open AI had SD3, the Microsoft writing, tagging their data. I don't think there are too many companies which can afford that. Interesting. And another common question that people asked uh, so, proprietary models versus open source again. So as training costs sort of decrease, right, uh, and price costs, so how do you think about the evolution of the model itself, like lower barrier to making prop models? And do you think it's a little challenging uh, for open source to deliver very compared to others? 
there are two ways I can answer this question. One is I can extrapolate from the past. Uh, bird always continued to be hard for folks to do in house. Just bird inference was quite hard for a lot of things for a very long time. Uh, at the same time, because the pie is increasing, now there are too many people who can do both, and it doesn't matter if you do both, it's just table stakes at this point. So, uh, if I were to make an argument for like, let's say five years or 10 years, up, I think there is no advantage. Like, I think for this, there is no advantage in doing your own proprietary mm -hmm. model training. And that is why I have huge respect for the Mosaic and the founders. They sold out at a speak. Uh, they, they basically proved that there's such a thing as timing the exit. Uh, so, so a lot of, uh, I think that was for five years old, next two years, it's, it's anyone's guess. Fair enough, fair enough. Just one follow-up question to the previous one. Uh, when you differentiate the models, how well do you think the open source models are compared to GPT and Palm, which is coming up, uh, in terms of unstructured data that normal people want to use, right? People have a lot of CSV files, people have a lot of legal documents. And they want to be able to know the insights from it quickly. Like, and GP, to be able to give that much amount of data to GPT, it's not very easy to integrate. Whereas Farm is selling its enterprise on GCP at a very high cost, which I don't know at, at a personal level people can use about. No, we can't. Yeah. It's too expensive. Yeah, so on a, on a normal level, how easy it is for it, uh, like examples like these to be implemented? Because let's say there are a lot of legal documents and people a slab bot, for example. I just want to ask my company slab bot saying, How many, do I have a leak tomorrow or not? Is it optional or not? I wanted to run through all the legal documents that the company has uploaded somewhere. So when you talk about these simple use cases that people can use, is, is it at that level also that you can write in? Um, yes. So, I mean, you might be familiar with this. But the best proxy is the MMLU benchmark. And on that, the Lama 70P is very compared to GPT 3.5 of Chinese Web March. Uh, the 0314 also in some ways. So 0301 was one, and uh, sorry, 0103 and 0314 were the two. Something like that. So uh, to compare to that, it's very complicated. And compared for an hidden question, the hidden subtext to what you just mentioned is the cost factor. There are two parts of cost, right? The first is, do you have to fine tune the model for your domain? My uh, conviction at the moment is that we will not have to fine tune that because all these information retrieval improvements, or as we like to call it, vector DBs, uh, they should reduce the cost of making that, asking that question towards something like 30, 40 cents. And if somebody is paying you, I don't know, thousand dollars a month. I'm willing to bet that they're also willing to spend hundred dollars in your productivity. That's that's the ratio is, is in my mind. Now, if this ratio is this assumption which I'm making on what is the productivity budget which corporations and organizations in general are willing to pay on their ICs is wrong, then this entire math falls apart. Because the flip side of my argument is I don't think that. Uh, information retrieval will get cheaper than 10 50 cents because that is tending towards the cost of storage and compute itself. So you can't, and you need some margin on it to make money, right? So that's that's where it works. Got it. Um, any other questions, guys? <coughs> yes, um, from engineering right now has a very high height. Do you think it will always be or will it get actually? Because there's only so much that people can run in terms of role-based arguments. Is, is middle management useful? <laughs> I, like if you don't have an answer to that, I don't have an answer to the prompt engineering. I, the way I think about it is all middle management is about taking very vague instructions from management and translating them into specifics for uh, ICs and other functions. Uh, if you model, if you think about middle management in that way, they are the original prompt engineers. Uh, and I'm inclined to believe that it's always valuable because all models, including your domain and task specific small models, will have their quirks. So adapting to that quirk, adapting to your tools is always useful. Uh, a very lame example of this is, uh, despite all the progress we have made, developers still fight over which terminal we can use. 
right? That's like the stupidest thing we can fight over, but we do, right? And there's like something like seven variants of Timberly terminal, right? From fish to ZSH to whatnot. So there's always some advantage of you adapting to the tool and not the tool adapting to you. There's always an expert user who is going to say that now how large is that expert pool? Is that going to be 1% of total population? 0.01% or something like 10 power minus 7, which is basically India's cricket team. How many prompt engineers will there be for software engineering? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. I can't predict the ratio. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that prompt engineering will go the same way as calendar management skills. Uh, but then uh, Urja and I will be unemployed very soon anyway. So. The point is, starting prompt engineering ISO. I, I don't know if you are interested in Masai. I should know that before I answer this question. <laughs> yeah, they should. <laughs> they should. They should. If they are going to start a school around this, they should uh, probably, like the simplest, fastest way, which is also somewhat which is true, is to start a school which is extremely focused on extremely fast reading speed, comprehension speed. And when I say extremely fast and uh, comprehension speed, I mean Think of what a B-school aspirant can read a balance sheet or an annual statement app. Uh, if, if you can find somebody who can, if you can coach somebody to the level that they can read an annual statement, uh, that's a degree of comprehension because you're going to compete with machines on comprehension. Uh, and verification of machine output is going to become very valuable because judgment will continue to be valuable. Accountability is going to continue to be valuable. Uh, that is how I think of it. And that is why, at least in most of my career choices which I'm making, I'm trying to take more and more accountability. Uh, because I believe that will continue to be valuable, even if me being able to do import PyTorch becomes less valuable. Cool. I think we've got I only have three, four minutes more of spiel, which is probably interesting more to software engineers and people who trade stocks than anybody else. Uh, uh, the first is basically a direct quote from Kalash Nath, our favorite uh, Bangalore CTO. Uh, or is that Dale Bay's now because he's an entrepreneur? <laughs> uh, but okay, it's still, still Kalash Nath. Sorry? Still Kalash Nath. Still Kalash Nath. Good to know. So uh, he has written a very famous blog, which he says that 20% of what zero hours can be automated basically this month uh, and more over a long time. What he also convinced is uh, the zero the leadership not fire people, but only use it as a counter against hiring more people. So that's how they are wanting it, which is obviously a counter positioning to uh, how to can position it. But those are positioning problems. But the main point is that a lot of software and not sorry, not software. Operations cost, which were text based, think of customer support, uh, pre sales, do I have a lead tomorrow as an option? They're already 20% cheaper, and the cost of that will continue to tend to zero. That is, that is my uh, claim here. Uh, same part is uh, verticalized. This just ties on to what I was trying to say about accountability and insurance. Verticalized LLMs are still very powerful. And when I say verticalized, I don't mean things like legal or medical, not in industry verticals, but use case verticals. Uh, the reason for that is because they guarantee, they're predictable. And uh, now uh, for a lot of things, we believe the broad thesis is that when humans buy software, we pay for predictability. And that is why every VP sales goes and buys Salesforce, every uh, CTO buys Jira. Even if they know that HubSpot is cheaper, even if they know that linear is better for engineers, they're still known by Jira because it's predictable, it's known. So humans have a very strong bias. We have always a concept of switching cost. Verticalized algorithms give you that predictability that we're always going to behave that way. And that is a huge uh, sell. If somebody can build a business like this, that you can swap the underlying things, but the uh, customer experience layer is intact. Uh, there's a team working on this in Bangalore. Uh, but if somebody else is also building a business like this, uh, again, please let me know. Uh, I would love to invest my own money in them. Uh, very, very bullish on this idea. It's very hard. I can service to enterprises myself without any other people. So I'm good to. Uh, and the most short term, which is the next, let's say, year to two, because of the first thesis, which is writing code becomes cheaper uh, and verification of code, manual human verification of code becomes more valuable. I believe every business which is services focused in some way, as an example, IT services, 
they will see a temporary, maybe a year long, maybe three year long margin expansion because their major cost center, which is operating cost center, is talent. And they will no longer need to hire junior talent. They will need to upskill a lot of junior talent very quickly, true, which will also maybe sometimes look at as a U curve. You will see a margin dip and then incline. Uh, but over a year or three, I will be very happy holding ITPs or Nifty IT if you're holding that. Uh, my best guess is 30 percent. Uh, I have put money behind 30 percent features, but I'm, I'm, there's some guesstimate behind 30 percent, and because that was picked specifically for Indian IT services. But I also believe this to be true, for instance, uh, of some version of knowledge services. So as an example, let's say if you're running a content studio, uh, you're a share chat, you're a TikTok, they're all services, or uh, even if they're including such the services with margin, uh, I believe all of them will see margin expansions. That's that's the but just for three years. Three years is expected. Yeah, what you're saying then after that? It's, it's competition. And then everyone will use it. Yeah. So then, then because competition always drives margin, right? It's always like your margin is my opportunity game plays out over longer durations. So uh, the, I believe that all of them will adopt these at varying rates and a varying degree of competence. And that is why I believe it will be serious, right? For instance, I believe McKinsey will adopt this very quickly, but will. I don't know, like, is it like, I don't know if quality circle of India, which is a McKinley subsidiary for the government of India, will that adopt it very equally quickly? I don't know. So those margins will take some time to uh, reach there. So yeah, my reasoning for analogy for this is that a lot of these companies have just started using email. So I believe things take time to adopt. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all from my end. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think nobody else has any other questions. In any case, let's just uh, go outside to some things. Uh, thanks a lot, Niraj, for coming down. Really appreciate it. Cool. I hope you had fun. If you didn't, uh, don't let me know. <laughs> no, okay, seriously, how uh, did you learn something from this? I learned that I should take the hand. <laughs> <laughs> I mind reading startups. <laughs> yeah. Always, always happy to help. Very bullish. Services expansion over to this India senior engineering talent is always a very understated advantage. So, for a very long time, Indian talent has mostly sold to India. So, we have always been on back foot, especially in engineering, uh, which doesn't apply anymore. So, pull down if you can invest in engineering services business. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what else?